Welcome back to Rethinking Politics. Today we're here for episode 24, and we're going to be discussing patents. Now, patents is everybody's favorite subject. Mm -hmm. I talk about patents with my friends. When I get together at parties, patents is what we discuss. It's by far the most common icebreaker I use at parties. If you haven't gotten a room laughing hysterically about your your patent jokes, then you're doing it wrong. If you do follow technology, maybe you do follow some of the patents that have been taken out by companies. I know I've seen headlines about them, never had the urge to click on them. Here's the thing about patents. You're going to think that this is an extremely narrow issue. And in terms of legal, you know, the actual amount of lawyers necessary to take care of the patent system, it's probably higher than you think, but relatively low compared to other things. And this seems like a very narrow field of interest. It's not. It's not. By the end of this episode, I think you're going to have a very different opinion of how important or unimportant patents are. And I couldn't agree more, Dan. And, and the reason we've decided to talk about patents, it's, it's one of the many issues that are all interconnected. And I would categorize as our generally as our critique of the current economic system all the way back in episode four when we talked about the the capitalist roots for this society and and how things have shifted over the years and changed and become much more complicated and much less of a free market and more of a big smorgasbord of different things this <laughs> this one specific area patents yeah. is just one hors d'oeuvre, if you will, in that smorgasbord of of different laws and different systems that play a very pivotal role in our in our economy. And it also ties in really well with with our with our episode a couple episodes ago where we talked about international trade and about how something that we could really do in order to be more competitive on the international market is to free up our own economy to allow people to progress effectively. And that's something that we want to talk about here in regards to patents. Patents is another issue that is interconnected that has, as Dan was saying, a very large impact while being surprisingly under the radar. It is not it is not right. a top election issue and yet it has a the other interesting thing about patents is that they are not controversial. Basically everyone agrees that we need patents. And everyone's in favor of patents. People may disagree on how they should be applied or on particular aspects of them or that they need to be reformed. But very few people argue against patents in general. Our goal here, as we talked about before, is to rethink things and to get past whatever is in the way of the truth. And that's just what we're going to do here. So the idea behind patents is there's a, a simple narrative. Someone has an idea of how to improve the world around them. And usually in terms of patents, we talk about invention. Someone has an idea of something they can create to make the world better. They take that idea or that creation and they go through a process to get it patented. And when they get it patented, what it does is it creates a protection and a restriction on that invention that stops others from using that invention. More particularly, it uh, allows the inventor to sue anyone who uses that invention without their permission, at least in the U.S. system is how it's done. The idea behind this is that we want to encourage innovation. We want to encourage invention. We need new ideas in order to progress. And by incentivizing these new technologies and new ideas through the use of patents, the world becomes a better place. And that idea sounds pretty good. We want people to be encouraged to make new ideas, to have new ideas, to share them with the world. It should go without saying, but I'm going to say it. You should never judge a system based on the motives of people doing it regarding government systems. I mean, let's put it this way. You don't continue to do the ineffective or bad thing just because the motive was originally good. You're more than welcome to give the creator of anything the benefit of the doubt, but that's not the only reason to keep doing something. It's because the original person <laughs> had good intentions. We need to evaluate right. what that system is actually doing 
not just the motives that inspired it. So what we need to do, and what, what we'd like to do, is we want to look at the case for patent law, the justifications for it, and the reasons for it, and kind of break down each of those ideas. And of course, the strongest arguments in favor of patent law, as we talked about early, are the utilitarian arguments. You know, what is does the most good for the most number of people? And the idea behind patent law is obviously that it uh, allows for more innovation and invention, and that is good for people. But before we talk about that, we want to talk about the moral justification and the moral case for patent law, because we are not utilitarians. We don't believe that just because the most number of people benefit that the, the, the law or the system is good. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to address utilitarianism in more detail. Uh, and I'm sure we do will. an episode on it. Yeah, at some point we probably because will. Because utilitarianism, while it sounds good on its surface, is fundamentally flawed. And if you're not so sure about that, let me give you an example. Utilitarianism would argue that you are completely justifying in killing an innocent person if the result of killing that innocent person saves two other innocent people's lives. Right. That's the classic, you push the person in front of the bus to stop the... To stop uh, something a lot, else. A lot of the common moral quandaries that are discussed in, in college things are based in helping you pit your, your ideas against utilitarianism. And it's a... I mean, that, these are interesting questions, right? But, but for our purposes, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the moral case outside of utilitarianism, and then we're going to discuss the practical effects of the system in a more utilitarian way in the sense of what does it actually do right and are the outcomes actually good the first moral argument as it were for for patent law is the idea that patents are simply society purchasing the right to use an invention from the inventor you know person a creates something society wants to have access to it and so they purchase the right using patent law and that all sounds it all sounds pretty good. The only problem with that is it bears no actual resemblance to what patent law does. When when an inventor applies for and gets a patent for their invention, number one, the government doesn't pay them any money. And when we talk about society, we're talking about the government. Number two, the government actually doesn't gain the right to use that invention. All a patent does is grant a temporary monopoly to the patent holder, saying you are the only one who has the right to use this invention for anything. You know, whether you want to sell it, you want to use it yourself, you want to sit on it and do nothing, all of those are perfectly fine. All we're doing is stopping others from using it. And so this argument that it's a sale, you know, from person A to society is not that it's that's bad. It's that that's just not true. That's not what's happening at <laughs> that's all. That's not what's happening, right? <laughs> right. If you were gonna, you could set up a system that does that instead of having patents that protect you from other people using these ideas, right? Instead of preventing other people from capitalizing on the things that you've invented, um, what you would do is you would say, "I have an invention, and I will, and government should give me X amount of money, maybe based on some measure of of what they th presume its utility to be." And the impact it'll have, and and there you go. That's that's what that would look like. Yeah, if the government were buying inventions and then allowing everyone to use them because now society owns them, that would be very very different from patent law as it stands. Right. Instead, as Rad indicated, the way patent law actually functions is you're re you're just restricting other people. You're you're granting a temporary monopoly. The next argument in favor of patents. And the primary moral argument that people make in favor of patents is the argument that patents are protecting the intellectual property rights of the inventor. Basically, the inventor's idea is his intellectual property. Therefore, the government has a just role in protecting that intellectual property, just as they do in protecting his physical property. This is the strongest moral argument that is made in favor of pens and it sounds really good just you know it sounds very sensible yeah it attaches the patents to a moral claim that we all almost all americans accept right the idea that that there is ownership 
that ownership entails certain things and you can't simply take something that someone owns. That's a, I, mean, I would defend that. I'll defend that to the day I die. Yeah. Right? You, don't, you don't just get to arbitrarily take things from someone and use them however you want. Yeah. Our right to our property is a, is a strongly ingrained idea, not just in the United States, but, but worldwide and is really a universal, you know, a universal human, human principle. Right. You will never find someone who is comfortable with you taking the food they're about to put in their mouth out of their hands and eating it. That will never be acceptable. And at the heart of that is a, is a basic human conception of property that is universal. Is universal. And so connecting it with that obviously makes it resonate. What is interesting and where it starts to break down is that ideas are different from physical goods. Physical goods are scarce. If I own any one physical good, you cannot own that same physical good. Knowledge is not a scarce good and does not operate in the same way. If I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that does not exclude you from knowing that 2 plus 2 equals 4. In fact, the opposite is true. The, the more that I know, the more likely it is that you'll know the same thing. Especially now that I've just told you. Yeah, your knowledge spreads in a way it propagates itself in ways that, that goods simply don't. <laughs> so the fundamental issue with pens is that pens are not actually about the scarce good, the physical creation, the invention itself. Because if you go in and steal someone else's invention, that's not a violation of patent law. That's a violation of many, many other laws against theft, against breaking and entering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Patent law isn't about the physical good, it's about the idea. And let me give you a state of nature example to demonstrate that. So in a state of nature where you have me and Dan and you have some other individuals here operating, we're all using our own resources, we're all trying to make the most for ourselves. As I'm doing this, I stumble upon some inventions. I, I spend a fair bit of my own time to invent the wheel. And I use this wheel to my benefit. For any of you who have seen the Flintstones, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dan, who lives near me, sees me driving my Flintstone car around our area. And of course, he thinks, first of all, Wilma, and then he thinks, hey, I should have one of those. And just from looking at it, you can understand how the wheel works, and Dan decides that he's going to try and create his own wheel in order to benefit himself. And he goes to work, and he makes his own wheel, and he starts to use it for his own good. And I go up to Dan, and I say, excuse me, Dan, but uh, I came up with that idea, so it's mine, and you can't use that idea. I know you didn't take anything that physically belongs to me, but you took my idea. He says, no, I would like to use this wheel because I put in the physical work to make it and I didn't take anything from you. I didn't take any of your parts, any of your components. Of course, we fight and I kill him. <laughs> hey. And no offense to Dan, but I think I am a little bit bigger and stronger. I take the wheel back for myself. Where is the justice in that action? Is it just for me to tell Dan that he took my ideas? Let me ask you some more questions that would clarify this. If I found an area nearby that had better berries, and I told Dan about that area, and Dan started gathering berries in that area, would I have a right to some of the berries that Dan collected? Not at all. If, for example, we had created a contract before, that might be different. But assuming that I just told him in passing, or he happened to see me picking those berries, that knowledge is not mine. It's his now, too. And as soon as it's his, he's welcome to use it. As we said before, knowledge is not scarce. Knowledge is bountiful. And I cannot physically force Dan to not use the knowledge in his head. Well, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it, it doesn't. If you, if you were to say that every idea should be owned... There'd be no reason to set limits on how long it should be owned. The, how old I am, how long I've owned the microphone I'm speaking into has no bearing on whether or not someone can steal it from me. Yes, and that's an excellent point, Dan, because if I have a right to bash Dan's head in 
because he stole my idea for the wheel, then I should be able to do that for anyone ever who uses my idea of the wheel without my permission. And my children should be able to do so forever. <laughs> you could pass on the ownership you, of the you idea. You should be way. able to, yeah, forever. If there was actually an ownership of principle that was true there. Right. You, if When you think about it too, like if you develop the wheel, right, you develop the wheel here and you're using it and you're, you convince everybody, you scare everyone around into not making wheels themselves out of things that they own. But you might discover at some point that somebody else invented the wheel entirely independent of you. And then what do you do? You figure out who did it first? Is that how ownership of this idea that is apparently not transmissible, you know, not that can't be held by two people at the same time, can't be acted upon by two people at the same time? Is that how this should work? I mean, the more you the more you think about what it means for knowledge to be treated as property, the more absurd it becomes. Knowledge is not property in any useful sense. And where it becomes the most absurd and the most disturbing, when you think about someone who's in really bad situation, who could improve their life significantly by making something that they could easily make themselves. And they are prevented because this knowledge is somehow owned by someone else, owned by somebody else. And they're, they're prevented from making their life and their family's life better because somebody else thought of it first, or at least got it patented first, which is to say that the moral case for establishing a patent system, the moral case for a concept of intellectual property is an absurdity. It's not property. It, it isn't property by any stretch of the imagination, nor could it be ever considered rightfully property. And if it were, you wouldn't be able to use math, right? Yeah. Because somebody because else someone created would it before own you. the idea of numbers, and someone else would <laughs> own the idea of multiplication. Right. It's just, it's just absurd. Yeah. It, and, and we won't belabor it any longer because it should be pretty self-evident that that the idea that you can own knowledge is absurd. And of course, the the reply and, and something that we're well aware of is that. Well, it's more complicated and it's more nuanced in the real world with inventions. Yeah. Amen. We agree with that completely. Yep. And if you agree that knowledge is not property, what that means is that we need a completely different system than patents in order to protect inventions. Because patents are temporary monopolies on ideas, which is temporary ownership of an idea which is unjust considering that knowledge is not property. So in the real world, when people invent things, you can remove patents and still have system in place, systems in place to protect them. Obviously, as I mentioned before, the very first system in place is that against theft, especially in today's modern world as these inventions become more and more complicated. If you don't have access to the physical invention or more often, if you don't have access to the complicated systems that were put in place to create that invention, you may not be able to recreate it. And then you follow that first principle up with other ideas, things like contract law. Copyright is a discussion that we need to have another time about how you can do things to protect people's property independent of protecting just knowledge. And we're not arguing that. What we're arguing is this idea of intellectual property, because that is the fundamental idea behind patents, is that you can own an idea. And as we move from the, the moral to the practical concerns, as we, as we consider the kind of utilitarian justifications for it and the, the impact it actually has on the system, the reason we begin with the moral case is because you need some way to explain why you're going to be ruining some people's lives and preventing them from using this knowledge. Right? Inevitably, you're doing some harm here. That's accepted. At least some harm is being done, and you're doing it in a way with no moral justification for it. That's a, that's a line that you have to justify in some way. And if you do not accept a kind of utilitarianism, then there is no justification. Then there is no justification. Yeah, the only justification you're left with for pens is the utilitarian argument that, yes, it's going to hurt people, but the benefits are going to outweigh the costs. So that's what we're going to look at next. So the primary claim of those advocating from 
for from a utilitarian perspective is to say that patents increase innovation. And this this seems intuitively true in a lot of ways. You say, look, people want to make things and they want there to be a reward for it. When you look at the cost of research and development, it can be obscene. Right? It costs it costs a fortune to make something and to invent certain things and to develop develop complicated technologies in our world that build on things. I mean, to build a wheel, right? What is your actual capital investment? Almost none. You need almost no physical goods. You could, <laughs> you could build it out of any material and it would prove the same thing. But what is required there is knowledge, right? It's the knowledge that makes that wheel valuable, not necessarily the goods that go into it. That's not quite as true in today's world where you're you using electronic devices with chips made from very specific materials mined in very few locations in the world, right? These goods are extremely valuable. The capital investment that goes into creating something at the highest levels is crazy expensive. It's a massive investment. And if you invest millions or billions of dollars into a technology, which you then sell a product made from that, and somebody can pick that up, reverse engineer it in five minutes, and be like, oh, this is how this works, and then make it themselves, clearly the argument goes, innovation would come to a halt. You have to be able to protect that investment that's necessary to create new technology. And the temporary monopoly we give is a small reward for the benefit we receive from these massive investments that then make the world a better place. So that's what's seen. Now let's talk about what's not seen, Dan. The argument that patents encourage innovation is not as clear-cut as it sounds. First of all, patents can encourage innovation, but they can also discourage innovation. Every time a patent is granted, there's the potential that competitors are going to be discouraged from innovating in that area because of the patent. So for example, if, if I receive a patent for my wheel and Dan invents a car that can go along with that wheel, he can't use that car without my wheel patent. And so why would he bother building a car around that wheel knowing he can never actually use it without my permission? It skews the incentives and can actually discourage competitors from innovating. While if there weren't patents and I invented a wheel, then Dan would not only want to use my wheel, but would have no reason not to build on that wheel, to invent a car and anything else he can think of. And the same is also true for the patent holder. When I've invented my wheel, I have this monopoly, and so why should I invent further? because I already have an edge up over the competition and therefore can gain a larger market share. But as soon as the patent is removed, that competition is going to encourage me to innovate more so that I can stay ahead. The driving force behind companies is to make a profit, and they do that by selling a good to a consumer. When there are multiple companies, which in this modern world with so many people, there's almost always multiple companies, Competition becomes an incredibly large factor because if the, another company sells the same good for cheaper or a better good for the same price, I'm going to lose business as a company. And so I have to make a better product for less in order to gain the profit that I seek by selling to a consumer. And this competitive force, this desire to be the best, drives innovation. You can see that. You can see that it's not just patents because there are areas that are not well covered by patent law that are not simply a wasteland of no innovation. Companies will consistently invest in innovation, not just for patents, but in order to beat out the competition to build a better widget and make more money. By widget here, of course, Brad means any given object. Any product, yeah any given thing. In fact, uh, an article from the American Association for the Advancement of Science shares some interesting information. One-fifth or more of all research projects in the United States are being chilled by patent holders. And when they say chilled, they mean being 
halted, stopped, slowed, curtailed in some way by patent holders. The sheer amount of research being canceled because of licensing issues is astounding. But at the same time, many of these researchers hold their own patents and therefore contribute to the problem. End quote. In other words, according to this study, 20% or more of all research projects in the United States are being curtailed simply because of patents. Because, as I was talking about before, you literally create a web of patents where if your company doesn't own patents in an area, they have no leverage in order to negotiate with the other patent holders in order to gain access to those patents in order to create anything. And this obviously discourages innovation. Because what you have is you have a whole bunch of mini monopolies. And within those monopolies, obviously competition is going to be reduced. That's the argument that gets rid of competition in that area. And that's what you see with patents. And that's terrible. One fifth of or more of all research projects. That's an insane percentage. And that's in research specifically. Yeah, you, you don't know how many companies are choosing not to get involved in technological innovation because they know there's no chance for them to act on anything they discover because of the existing patents. So let me give you an example. Um, the smartphone industry, you know, you've got Apple, which, you know, invented the smartphone as we know it is now. They were approved for many different patents when they did that. And the current patent system is very complicated and very illogical. And so they couldn't just patent the smartphone because that's not how patents work today, even though that's how you think it would work if you could own an idea. And so the other companies that want to create smartphones have to start doing a very complicated dance about how they build their smartphones to avoid these patents. And then, of course, as they complete their dance, they start getting as many patents as they can to stop any other companies from making phones the way they make them. And the patents continue to pile up and there are lawsuits back and forth and back and forth. And the end result of this is that instead of being able to build on each other, they're restricted more and more and are limited in how they can innovate. In fact, the areas where we have seen innovation are in the areas where they weren't able to secure patents. If Apple had been able to secure a patent that said, you invented the smartphone, so for 20 years, <laughs> no one else gets to make a smartphone, what would have happened is we would all be using the Apple One right yeah. now. We wouldn't have wireless charging. We wouldn't have the infinity displays that we have now. We wouldn't have the pinhole cameras that we have and so many other the the fingerprint sensors so many other technologies that were spurred on by competition wouldn't be there when you realize that the lines are often arbitrary and as such different spheres of patent law are treated differently and in nowhere is that more gray than in the sphere of software because software you could code in a way that looks completely different from another code but does the exact same thing which is to say all the pieces come together, they're completely different, but it solves the same purpose, which means that to patent anything there, they have to patent it by purpose. And as soon as you say by purpose, what you're patenting is the goal of the software. <laughs> you can't have the same goal with <laughs> right, your software right. that we have with our right. software. It is absolutely uh, uh, mind boggling. That, if that doesn't, if you can't, you can't see in that how many problems that's going to cause. Then I don't know what to tell you. Another area where there's an unseen negative to patent law is in market distortion. We've talked about this before, but the market is not some entity. When we talk about the free market, when we talk about the economy, it's not some entity that makes decisions or acts. The market is simply made up of millions upon millions upon billions of individuals. These individuals act, and the reason they act is to benefit themselves, to be better off than they were before they acted. Otherwise, they wouldn't act. Whether I choose to sit in the chair or get out of the chair is based on my desire to have more value in my life. 
Usually for me, that means staying in the gym. (laughs) (laughs) But the important thing to understand is that, first of all, everyone's actions are individual. And they're based off of their own preferences, what they want, what they value. And they always act to improve their value, what they think will improve their value. By improve their value, you mean improve their life, right? Increase the value of their life or or, or yes, move them exactly. closer Thank to the things Not talking, they want. When I say value, I mean things they value, what they – not even things, what they value, not monetary yes. value. For me, staying in the chair – is because I value the comfort that I'm enjoying in this chair as I record this podcast, not because of any monetary yes. value. But it's still value that I gain, which is why I act. Thank you for clarifying, Dan. In the market, that same exact principle is true. When I go to the store and I purchase a candy bar for 95 cents, I do it because I value that candy bar more than I value the 95 cents. Otherwise, I wouldn't make that exchange. Which means that both me and the Walgreens that I purchased the candy bar from benefit from that exchange. Because Walgreens would rather have the 95 cents than the candy bar. And I would rather have the candy bar than that 95 cents. And what that's called is mutually beneficial exchange. And all exchange on the free market without force, without coercion, is going to be mutually beneficial. That both parties are going to act because they believe they they will benefit from it. Whether or not they actually benefit from it is going to be <laughs> right. based off of how well they assess what they want. Right. Just like if I purchase a candy bar and decide I don't want it, that's that's not Walgreens' fault. That's my fault. Fraud and coercion are a whole other issue that obviously are not the free market. So that's what the market is made up of is all is millions upon millions upon millions of these exchanges that are taking place all the time. And the way Brad is, I, is defined market is not arbitrary. That's that's demonstrably true. Tell me the last decision you make that you thought wouldn't improve something that you value, right? Wouldn't get you closer to something you want or wouldn't provide something you want. Every decision you make, conscious or unconscious, deliberate or random, from scratching your leg to, <laughs> to going to the store to get groceries, right? Now, in all of these decisions, there are trade-offs. You have to to choose one thing. You have, you're not choosing others. To spend 95 cents on a candy bar, you're not getting others. And as you said, you may be more or less wise in this decision, and you may be more or less correct about the outcomes of these decisions. But every decision between willing participants aims towards each of them being better off. Better off. And, and so what that means is that in a free market – What you have is millions upon millions of these decisions, and each of these decisions is going to result in people being better off. And so every time an exchange is made, people become better off. The more of these decisions that are made, these exchanges that are made, the better off people are going to be, which is why we talk about leaving the free market to itself, not because it's some magical (laughs) entity, but because we're saying giving people the opportunity to exchange in order to better themselves will allow people to better themselves. It follows. (laughs) And so when it comes to market distortion, what I'm talking about is when force is brought into the equation, things change. In terms of patents, you've got force where you're restricting people from creating something that they have every ability to create because that idea has already been monopolized upon by that po- by that patent. When you do that, you distort the market because now people are not able to do what they would choose to do. Otherwise, there'd be no need for the government to act. And so you're forcing people to not do what they would freely choose to do, which forces them to pick a secondary or a third or a fourth option, depending on how much distortion there is. And in terms of patents, patents are so ubiquitous and used in so many industries that they distort everyone's choice. I'm confident in saying that in the United States today, every single person, their actions, their choices, excuse me, have been distorted because of patents. I can choose between a Samsung smartphone, an Apple smartphone, or a few other Android smartphones, 
and they are the phones that they are today, and my choices are the choice they are today in the smartphone industry because of patents. You know, my home, if I choose to purchase a home, costs what it does because of the patents that are in place for the insulation being used, the patents that are in place for the way that they treat the wood, the patents that are in place for the paint companies, and the restrictions that places on their competition to give me a better service. And if you hadn't noticed with these distortions, it's usually making things worse. Because if it wasn't making things worse, it wouldn't distort. If the government passes a law that says everyone needs to do what they were already going to do, it wouldn't distort the market <laughs> because it wouldn't change it would anything. It would not substitute anyone's preferences for some other preferences. They would act on the thing that they think would do the most good for them. Yeah, the problem is when you stop people from doing what benefits them, they're going to not only not be benefited as well, it's going to affect the overall economy. And that's what we talk about distortion. Even though I'm not a smartphone manufacturer, what the smartphone manufacturers do affects me. And that's how that distortion ripples through the economy and has effects that are very hard to see. And perhaps the most disgusting demonstration of this is the game it allows people to play with patent farming, where people will take out a, a, as many patents as they can think of that are likely to be used by companies, and then they sue them if they get anywhere close. And this is important. It doesn't have to be exactly right. It just has to be remotely close. And then you sue a company that's, a, that's doing something similar. And because of the, the crazy costs of the court fees, these patent trolls will say, now look, this court case will cost you 2 to $5 million. Or you can pay me $100,000 and I'll give you my patent. And here's what's interesting about patent trolling, Dan is that because patent trolls exist, good faith companies do the logical thing, which is to, whenever they have a patent, to find as many possible patents that are close to that one and patent it first before a patent troll comes <laughs> into place, which is part of why you get such a massive web, is because what we've created is an artificial game. And in that artificial game, the incentives are skewed. And so people are going to invest money and resources in things that are not actually going to benefit them if it weren't for this artificial game, which has created these false incentives that result in incredible malinvestment in things that aren't actually producing. Right. And as Dan said, that's just an example of the far extreme of how insane the whole system has become because it's not founded on any ethical principle. This is this is the craziest part. So we looked at a number of studies, we looked at we've we've thought we we've tried to think this through as clearly as we can and looked at the implications and, and and there are a number of implications that you would not see unless you're looking for them, which we have mentioned here. Um the the way that it distorts the market, the way that it interrupts normal exchanges, the way that it creates this game on top of things, right? So what people will say then, and there are, there are people who do studies and write books on this. They look at this and they go, the patent system actually might be hurting innovation. So what we need to do is we need to improve it. We need to tweak we're gonna, it. We're going to change it so that it's harder for patent trolls to have these court cases. We'll, we'll make them pay a portion of the fees if they lose the case. That way, companies will fight them more and there'll be less patent trolls. Right? They look at these things like that, that they could improve, that would improve it. It would, it would make some of these details better. And they try then to perfect the system so that it continues as it is. Just better. But look, the system is unethical. There is no intellectual property. The idea is absurd. It is not doing what it's supposed to do. And it's not doing what it's supposed to do in ways that a lot of the people can't even imagine, right? The effects of it are massive. Brad said it, it is a defining element of what your phone is like. I bet you didn't know that going into this. And when you put those together, this is the point. These two things, the fact that these two, that it's unethical and it doesn't work, are not incidental. 
It's not, it's a, not coincidence. a coincidence that these two that these two occur side by side, because it's unethical. It doesn't work. And if you look at whether it's ethical, you can guess if it's going to work. Because if things don't align at a very basic level, then they're not going to align in the real world. That's why we talk about a state of nature on such a regular basis, because there are underlying principles, not just of of human nature, but of the simplest way to put it is natural law that work and that have always worked and will always work in that when we align laws with those natural laws, what you get is not just moral laws, but effective laws. And when you instead make artificial and arbitrary laws, that instead of being based off of principles and based off of human behavior, they are instead based off of you know, lofty ideals or something as simple as utilitarianism right. we, in this case. How improve upon mankind? There's going to be a breakdown because of the way humans behave. You know, like with patent law, what we're doing is we're flying in the face of the way that humans behave. And the way that humans behave is that someone invents fire and then we all use fire. Someone invents <laughs> the wheel and then we all right. use the wheel. We are not creatures of isolation. We are creatures of communication and growth. And patents fly in the face of that. And that's why they don't work because of those underlying principles. Patents are a broad way to try and manage the human desire to improve their lives by gaining knowledge and applying that knowledge. You cannot manage that. You cannot manage that. You cannot try and control that without doing serious harm. And as you said, at that point, your incentives are going to be really twisted and the system is going to become a game. It's going to become a game where people try and use the rules to get ahead. Whereas if, this, if the incentives in the system aligns with human nature, what you get is something that makes that is intuitive, makes sense, and just reflects the way people behave anyway. It focuses on preventing things that are evil, things that are wrong. Absolutely. If you applied that here, this is the, this is the, the kicker. The kicker. Here, I had a, <laughs> I had a teacher who would, who at least once a day would give us a speech where he would begin it with, and here's the kicker, folks. And, and <laughs> there were a lot of kickers. I, I must have been kicked an awful lot in that class. If you applied this, there are a few areas that would immediately improve, and one of them is really obvious and it's com and it's commonly discussed but it's rarely discussed in terms of patents and it should be because patents are the defining problem it absolutely should be it's medicine medicine is expensive and there's a reason for it and it has nothing to do with most of what people say it's not the actual cost of medicine it's the cost of the patents right it's not the cost of medicine it's not the cost of development the cost of development is a is a secondary issue related to the FDA and and the mm -hmm. other organizations there. Those things have an effect. And all of those things would have to be considered to, to, to understand it fully. But the fundamental problem is patents. Yeah, if you look at the cost of, of pharmaceuticals, of drugs, and how inflated they are, and people talk about how you can get these drugs in other countries for so much cheaper, and it's not because those companies are, those countries are cutting corners, and in some countries <laughs> maybe, but that's not the reason. The reason is because they don't have to, to deal with the monopolies that we have to deal with here. There are so many monopolies in the medical industry that overlap and overlap and overlap these patents, these restrictions that stop people from getting the care that they need. That's what we're talking about. You know, we talk about trying to make affordable health care, something that everyone wants and yet no one's talking about what's stopping them from doing that. And yeah. in, in, in at least one strong area, there, like Dan said, there are many areas we need to address. There are many regulations and different issues we need to look at. But one very convincing argument is that if we remove patents, we will drastically reduce the cost of drugs, drastically reduce the cost of medical technology, and allow for massive changes. And if that's not a convincing utilitarian argument, 
I don't know what is. Right. The, there was the most famous the most famous case with the medicine that w- they were charging like 750 bucks a pill, right? And everyone was freaking out and they're like, "Geez, look at these corporations screwing people over." It's like this is this is only possible in a world of intellectual property where one person has patented the idea for this medicine and people whose lives depend on this medicine who could probably gets their local chemist to mix it up for them, cannot use that knowledge to save their own lives and are thus forced to go into crazy debt or do different things to try and get this medicine. The consequences of twisting natural incentives, of of ignoring the ethical concerns and trying to reshape the world to your will, regardless of human nature, are terrible. Yeah, whether or not the intention is noble doesn't change the fact that what has been done is incredibly destructive. And that's something that we can see not just on an ethical perspective, but on a utilitarian perspective, because as we said, they tend to go hand in hand. They do. And so if we want to see things become better, we need to start doing things right. With that, we hope that you found some things interesting in this episode. Obviously, this is not an issue that is discussed in these terms. You find that if you look into it, that the people who do discuss these issues find similar things. Look up studies, find books. There's a number of them out there on this subject. Um, again, they'll probably recommend that we reform it as they see the various problems that we've pointed out. They're failing to see the big picture, and we hope that you can follow that a little bit more. But we invite you, as usual, to do your own study. Go look this up yourself. Think this through for yourself. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.